Okay, so this is just a quick video about the Royal Enfield Himalayan, which I've now done 15,600 miles on. The bike's currently in a container coming back from America, which has completed a ride from New York to LA, uh, leading 11 other, other bikes, other riders uh, on a coast to coast. Uh, the bike is about seven, well, I bought it in January, so I've had it eight or nine months uh, and uh, bought it when I had a broken ankle, so I didn't start riding it till sort of March or April. So I've done a lot of miles in not a lot of, not a long length of time. Uh, a lot of that was uh, doing Land's Entry John and Groats guided tours. I do a run called the Garbage Run and take 25 people at a time, so I've done three of those. And then more, most recently the uh, 6,000 mile trip across America. Uh, I bought the bike on spec, I'd not ridden it uh, before buying it, I was just intrigued by it, I was intrigued by the price, I never thought it would come in at 3999 I always thought it was going to be more expensive than that. Uh, they did announce it at £4,000, but I thought by the time it comes to market it's going to be more like four seven or something like that, you know, to compete di directly with a Honda CRF 250 But to be £700 less than Honda's 250L, the CRF 250L was um, such a surprise. Um, and I guess I liked everything it offered. It uh, seemed a very simple machine, very basic. Now, my background was riding from Sydney to uh, London on a 105cc Honda CT110, an Australian postal bike. So uh, I, I always liked and started off by riding smaller bikes with simple technology. Not always a lot of power, but you know they would chug along and they would do the job. Uh, I then took that bike across America, New York to Alaska a few years later. And after that, I worked in the motorcycling press. I edited Adventure Bike Rider magazine. I then bought a BMW R1200 GS, a liquid cool one, and I did trips across America on that and to Iceland. So my background in motorcycle travel is interest it is varied, not interesting, varied. Um, and I guess that's why the Himalayan struck a chord because it, I thought here's a bike that can do some uh, off-road work, some tarmac work. It comes in at a good price. But it seems very uh, set up for travel motorcycling. Uh, but be it the fact that you could get the hard panniers for it, the centre stand, um, the, the luggage rack, the front racks, everything about it just seems to say this could be a good travel bike. I think there were issues with the uh, reputation of the bike and the reliability of it. I think when it came out in India, they'd had problems. Um, and that, you know, it, it didn't really put me off, but it makes you think, well, do I want to buy a bike that might break down on these guided trips? Because obviously if you're leading 25 riders, you need a reliable bike. So I was kind of taking a bit of a gamble. Uh, the other option was to buy a Honda CRF 250L, uh, but the issue with that is you need to fit a bigger tank. Uh, it's not got a comfy seat as standard. It's harder to fit panniers. Um, and so, yes, it might be a better trail bike, but it's not a better travel bike. Uh, and so again, come to the Himalayan, I bought it, first time I rode it was trail riding, I pretty much broke the bike in uh, doing trail riding and I was really impressed with the way it handled trails first and foremost, it's got a really nice upright riding position, I think that engine, you know people look at it and go 24.5 brake horsepower is not a lot but then it's got good torque and with a long travel motor so it's got a long stroke to it, uh, it means it's just got nice tractable usable torque, um, it's, it gets good natural traction even with a sort of road biased MT60 tyres, in, in, in claggy mud it would sort of generate traction all on its own. So I really like the way that the engine suited uh, trail riding, I really like the upright riding position, it was well balanced, the weight of 191 kilos which some people say is overweight, well it, didn't, never, it never felt it when you were riding it, certainly not off road. Uh, and I did drop it a few times and pick it up, it never felt 191 kilos. I have a Husqvarna TR650 which weighs about the same, maybe a little bit less, but that feels a lot heavier than the Himalayan. And I think because on the, something like the Husky, the weight sits high, whereas on the Himalayan the weight is all low. The rims are steel and I think they account for a good proportion of the weight, but at least that means that the weight is nice and low. So I run the bike in uh, on the trails, I had the first 200 mile service. The engine is very tight I think when you first get it, you know, it's a gentle running in process, you're not supposed to do more than 40 miles an hour for the first 300 miles and then 50 miles an hour for the next 1000. I mean, I was a bit more aggressive than that, finding it would run easily at 50 miles an hour in top gear and it didn't seem to be straining the engine, so that's how I ran my bike in. But it probably took till 1200 miles before it felt really uh, relaxed and broken in and it took a good thrashing, I must admit, to really break its, break its back as such. And just to get it revving cleanly and tech, the, the, the becomes this, um, I guess, vibrations of roughness, uh, 4,000 revs, 5,000 revs, below 1,000 miles on the clock. 
But as you push over it and you and you sort of stretch its legs more and more, it really softens in and the engine becomes more enjoyable. It never becomes really more powerful. I guess that's the thing. It's not a powerful engine. And if you really wanted to race to get somewhere when you're in a real hurry, then it is lacking. You know, when you can only do sort of 65, 70, 75 on a longer straight. You know, there's times when I, I want to be doing more than that. Um, but, but you can't. And, and that's the... the um, compromise that I guess you get with all bikes but in an age when we call a 95 brake horsepower Africa twin underpowered then you know how much more power would you need to give the Himalayan before people stop complaining that it was underpowered even if you went up to 50 horsepower people would still say they wanted 60 so I guess you've just got to accept that 24.5 horsepower is what you've got 32 newton meters of torque is what you've got and it's that what characterizes the bike it's a very relaxed engine that likes to drive out of corners just on torque it doesn't really like being pushed up to the red line uh, it'll do it but it's not as rewarding as just sort of riding that wave of torque in the mid range and i think it certainly relaxes your riding um, people complain uh, so i've complained about the nature of the brakes the front for a modern day bike doesn't have the bite the initial stab of the of of, of, of lock up that a lot of bikes do now you know you one finger pull on a lot of bikes now and it pulls you up sharp the Himalayan still needs a good two, three finger pull on it, and it also needs a bit of back brake. The back brake is really strong. The front brake, it's 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 good. It's not a bad brake. It just its characteristic is needing more force on it than you would with a lot of other modern bikes like the G three ten GS BMW. That's got a really grabby front brake. Now, which is great, you know, and, and people might like that. But again, trail riding when you stood up. And you're in mud and you're in shale or sand and you don't want to grab a front brake i like that gentle um retard retardation is that the word uh of, of the front brake so yeah so i got the bike 1100 miles or so 1200 miles and i started doing the garbage runs which were two and a half thousand miles mainly tarmac loaded up a lot of people behind me um and i found the bike was really came into its own in that when you started to do the a and b roads uh, when you're not on the motorways, the bike is just. I think what characterizes it best and what I like about it best is the way it, that it rides. The ride quality is exceptional, which is something often budget bikes or lower end bikes suffer from. They put budget suspension on, which seems badly tuned to, to the nature of the bike, and it really it doesn't ruin it, but it doesn't help it. The CB500X Bionda, for example, it's a great bike, great package, but when you start to get into choppy surfaces on tarmac up in Scotland, for example, it just can't corner and deal with ripples and bumps it just gets out of shape it wants to stand up and it's just not enjoyable uh, what i liked about the himalayan is that it's just whoever set it up whoever designed the uh the, sus the suspension tune because it's just conventional forks and a single rear shock with preload adjustable at the rear no adjustment at the front whoever set that up i think really knew what they were doing and were trying to achieve the bike rides soft and the softness suits the bike's nature, but it's really well damped. So it, it, it is absorbing bumps and ridges and ripples on and off road really well and, and as fast as you need it to, to be able to keep the wheels on the ground and keep good traction and just to keep the bike stable. So I think it, it floats along much better than most budget to mid range bikes. And even dare I say it, I think it rode better on rough road than it did my electronically equipped GS liquid cool 1200 so I think they really knew what they were doing there's not a huge amount of suspension travel or ground clearance and I think off-road sometimes that can catch you out because you'll be hitting and clattering the sump especially on rutted terrain or rocky terrain but um, the suspension as it is 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 it's is the Himalayans probably its strongest point and I think in that regard it looks like a classic old bike you know it, people say it's old-fashioned it's it looks 20 years out of date already but I think yes it does styling wise it looks a, an old older machine a classic line to it but the way it rides is is uniquely modern and and i think the way that the power is made and the way that the bike rides is modern it's a modern bike with a i guess a more traditional or i don't know what you call a styling some people like it some people don't some people call it ugly some people call it charming um but whatever you think to the styling the way it rides is what is what matters to me and also the way it carries its uh, luggage capacity its load capacity now i've got the aluminium panniers the 500 pound optional panniers 
Uh, and I also have to carry a lot of other stuff, being the guide, I have to carry first aid kits and survival kits and all sorts of spare waterproofs. So I, I have a couple of dry bags on the front front racks, and that is a feature that I guess most journalists or most magazine writers or most initial buyers overlook. But the fact that you've got sturdy frames to mount dry bags full of gear on the front, and therefore to to keep, instead of having all the back weight on the back and having it sit light on the front wheel, almost speedboat light, you've got weight on the front, so it just makes the bike sit nicely, and I think that's what helps it to corner quickly and competently when you've got it fully loaded. So I really like that. It carried its load well. The torque engine was good for that. Um, and all in all, I, I just came away from those those 10,000 miles of guided trips in the UK impressed. Going into America, I guess I knew what to expect. Uh, and, and I think America, it revealed itself to be underpowered on those interstates where lorries and trucks are doing 80 miles an hour. There's no way a, a Himalayan can deal with a, an 80 mile an hour truck. And uh, you know, you have to sit there at 65, at 70, you have to do your best, but you know I was with a KLR 650 that could only do them sort of speeds in comfort. So yes, the bike isn't f fast f for motorways, but then so are so aren't a lot of the other uh, dual sport bikes, and I think that encourages you to get off the, the 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 highways a little bit. I think where it did struggle a bit on the on the as the altitude increased above sort of seven thousand, eight thousand feet, and we had incline you know inclines into a headwind there you would feel you just wanted that little bit maybe five horsepower more just to keep the revs up in fifth so you could just keep maybe 65 a sustained 65 whereas i was down to 60 miles an hour and if you were solo that wouldn't be an issue at all i think you just accept it you'd relax into it you deal with the wind you deal with the hills but when you've got 10 bikes behind you one of which is a gs 1200 and an africa twin and a 500x and a turn away 660 then you i guess you feel the urgency to keep it pinned so for 6,000 miles, I was 4,000 of those, I was flat out. So, you know, oh yeah, it's underpowered for the interstates, but it's a 400cc bike. So it, it didn't um, it didn't surprise me in that regard. Where it did probably surprise me was how agile and encouraging it was to explore the little trails that I'd find, you know, maybe on an evening or during the day, I'd go off sometimes and do some trails fully laden. And I think that's where the bike really comes into it. So we're as an exploration, as an overland adventure machine, uh, we, which you can take on a multitude of surfaces, feel confident on them, and, and also get yourself, not be afraid to get yourself into a tricky situation. I got myself up on an ATV track, very sandy, steep. I had to turn the bike around and I, can, I could lift it around on my own and I didn't worry. Whereas if it had been a GS1200 or even a 10 660, which is taller and top heavy, I think I would have been more daunted by that. So the Himalayan came into its own, uh, so it's 15,600 miles. It's, I mean, to me, without doubt, it's probably the best overall bike, travel bike on the market at the minute, which sounds kind of overselling it maybe, but I just can't think of any other bike that's come out that deals, that does everything so competently for such a low price. You know, or a bike that's thought so much about what the end user is going to do with it and and what they need, be it the front racks, the rear rack, the fact that you get the side panniers um, built, you know, they've been designed to be within the handlebars and that's very good. Or a bike that's got such a nice natural upright standing position that it's got nice foot pegs as standard. You know, the Africa Twin, you've got to up spec, you've got to go out and buy aftermarket foot pegs because the, the ones that they put on standard are just too small for stood up riding. But on the Himalayan at £4,000, you get nice, chunky, serrated pegs with rubber inserts you can take out, and you've got a good peg. Basic stuff like that means it's just a no-brainer. Riding it back, back um, alongside the GS310, now that bike could have been fantastic, and it is fantastic with the Rally Raid kit on it. You know, It really transforms it. It makes it the bike that it always should have been. But in basic BMW spec, that's a, that's a budget bike with... Um, no real effort in trying to make that a GS to make it a go all, go anywhere bike. They've just sort of rolled that out the door, put a badge on it, and it's a decent bike. I'm not knocking the bike for what people are going to likely to do with it, but there's no attempt by BMW to to really offer that as a as a straight out of the factory usable bike. And I think that's what the Himalayan is. It's a straight out of the factory. Um, usable travel bike you know so for four and a half thousand pounds with the panniers you've got a bike that would take you around the world and, and i think that's it's almost revolutionary in its simple affordability uh and if it was simple and affordable an average bike fair enough 
but the fact it's a simple and affordable and enjoyable and capable bike then I think that is it's almost too good to be true but it I feel it is too good or it, it, you know it proves that it, something can be br brilliant um, and so I've been impressed in terms of reliability I have had nothing no no issues the only issue I did have at 4,000 miles the head bearings had dried up and they were a bit notchy so the, when I went in for a service they had them greased um, I had what else happened I had the I did have the this the headstock bolt come loose on a rough trail but I think that was probably down to the talking issue from when I had the uh, bearings greased um, I've had no broken spokes no snap cables um, there's a bit of a clatter on pickup at the minute which I think maybe cam chain or something but it just needs maybe a little bit of service it's, it's been neglected a little bit service re uh, regime wise uh, service intervals are, are 3,000 miles for valve trek and 6,000 for oil I've found that the valves have not moved they've needed one adjustment slight adjustment at about 8,000 miles uh, so I now do oil changes every 3,000 valve checks every six uh, um, I think it's always good to keep fresh oil in it. Uh, but in terms of wear and tear, the bike still looks and feels fresh. It, uh, uh, you know, it's not really showing its miles other than the damage it's suffered from being dropped and thrown around. I mean, I, I ride it harder on the trails, and it gets dropped a lot. And the, the biggest issue I've had is it's just I, I sort of put a bend in the the gear lever, but it's still rideable and easily straightable. So. Um, I think that's it. I don't know what else there is to say. So 15,600 miles on a Royal Enfield Himalayan. I think Royal Enfield have nailed this one. Uh, I think they've built a brilliant bike that's exceeded my expectations with it. I would happily buy another one tomorrow. I would happily buy a fleet of them to guide people on. Uh, I have faith in the bike, which is always the main thing uh, of a travel bike. The biggest concerns people have are, is power. But power to me is one element of what makes a good travel bike. So, uh, it, yes, you could always improve a bike. And in the Hemelane's case, maybe 10 brake horsepower would improve it. But then it, it's you can't have a perfect bike. There's always going to be fail. There's always going to be areas for improvement in everything. Um, and I think what's good about the Himalayan, it's fast enough to enjoy traveling. Uh, and it's also cheap enough to allow you to spend the money you would otherwise have spent on a bike to to actually fund the act of travel so all in all uh, i think this is a great bike for anyone who um just wants a bike to get them out there to allow to allow enable them to ride terrain that they probably otherwise wouldn't have felt capable on it's for somebody who wants to ride a mixture of surfaces be it tarmac or off-road it's not an out and out trail bike and it's not an out and out road bike it fills that that big chasm in between. Um, so that's it really. Uh, the bike's going to be back in about six or seven weeks. Not sure what I'm going to do with it. Uh, whether I refurb it. I mean, it does need maybe a good service because it's got hammered across America. Uh, and then use it again for next year's trips. Maybe Iceland next year. So I might be taking a group to Iceland. Uh, again, the Himalayan would be perfect there. I took a GS 1200 to Iceland and it was brilliant for getting there and it was brilliant for the tarmac roads. But for when you were going alone through remote tracks where there were river crossings, it's too big, it's too heavy, too cumbersome, too expensive. You know, it's too expensive to drown a GS 1200 in an Icelandic river. But a Himalayan, you'd take that river and, and you'd, you'd deal with it as, as it came. So, yeah, Iceland and, I mean, Kind of the world's your oyster. Does it need a 650 engine twin that's coming? Uh, I, don't, I think the 650 twin engine in it would change its characteristics completely and, and, and change it from... I mean, to me, the Himalayan is a mule. It's a mule machine. It's it's uh, it's not a racehorse, it's a mule. And I think if you put the twin engine in it, it would lose some of its muleness and become something in between. So for me, 410cc is all you need. And uh, that's it, I've talked long enough. So. That's it. Buy one or don't buy one. At least test ride one if you're curious because it's not for everyone but it could be for you.